head body this is once it's stayed and you are on a seat a seat that is at the table where we bring to you the most powerful intellectual capital social substance on the planet with a black lens that hopefully allows you to open yourself up to truth and increase your capacity and reclaim any agency that you might have given away before you got on this particular moment. I am proud. I am very much inspired and truly grateful for the time that I'm able to spend with one of the probably top 10 culture creators over the last five decades, uh, that is 50 years. Um, he probably only, if he would have run for president, would have been number one, but he's definitely in the top four. He's not a surgeon, so we won't credit him for starting a, a medical college. So some of my favorite are uh, Sutton, obviously President Obama, uh, just for giving a light where many doubted. But Dr. Michael Eric, I don't know how we missed the Dyson, and that's doctor. Thank you so much for all that you continue to give our community and the body of work that you give abounds. Thank you so much, sir. It's great to be here with a iconic figure like you, a young man doing legendary things already. So I'm honored to be in conversation and to have this opportunity and platform. Well, let's talk about being a, a black man in America. Mm. Um, and for those who don't know, if you will, just share an, an idea of your upbringing, where you came, and why you are what many know is the only Black dictionary where we learn words and white people know that we know words. <laughs> Bless you for that, sir. <clears throat> well, I was reared in Detroit, Michigan, uh, from the D, as they say, West Side. Um, <clears throat> and growing up there, 63 years old now, born in 58, saw the 60s in Detroit, the founding of Motown 59 with Barry Gordy and Smokey Robinson as a vice president, of course, one of the greatest songwriters, if not the greatest songwriter of the latter part of the 20th century. Uh, certainly Bob Dylan recognizes his poetic inventiveness. Aretha Franklin, C.L. Franklin, Charles Gilchrist Adams, my pastor, Frederick Douglass uh, uh, Sampson, and uh, Frederick George Sampson, I should say. Frederick Douglass Haynes is another great preacher out in uh, Dallas, Texas. So when I came up in Detroit, uh, of course, we were known as the center and seat of Black cultural production, but we were also tagged, you know, the murder capital of the world. So here we are on the one hand, creating enormous, um, you know, inspiration through cultural products, especially of singing, of gospel music, of secular music, of Motown driving the engine of Black cultural creativity, but also the political dynasty that would begin in, I think, around 74 with the election of Coleman Young, and then uh, a lawyer, you know and I know, uh, Kenneth Cockrell, who was Johnny Cochran before Johnny Cochran was Johnny Cochran, and Johnny Cochran was a dear friend of mine and an extraordinary barrister and lawyer, but Ken Cockrell you know, use those 15 and $20 words. Uh, he was a Marxist, he was radical. He would cuss out right-wing white supremacists, including judges, and then stand tall uh, for his people. Those were inspirations uh, to me. And in growing up in Detroit, um, <clears throat> Judge Damon Keith at my church, Elliot Hall at my church, John Conyers, the great Congressman, uh, at my church. Uh, these were inspiring Black men, along with Dr. Frederick Sampson, who was the pastor of the church, a tall six foot three, four Shakespearean Black man, uh, gave sermons without notes, quoted both Bertrand Russell and Shakespeare and W.E.B. Du Bois and Paul Lawrence Dunbar in the pulpit, and had a sense of social conscience. And this is what shaped me. My father was an automobile industry worker for Kelsey Hayes Wheel Break and Drum Company, a master setup man. My mother was uh, employed for a while by the Detroit Public Schools uh, as an assistant to teachers. 
And so we came up as a working class black family struggling against poverty uh, and injustice. My five, five of us boys, four brothers, all black boys uh, born in the ghetto of Detroit. So I, I um, have enormous sympathy for my mother and father. Uh, and we went different paths. You know, my brother Everett, God bless his spirit and God rest his, rest his memory, um, <clears throat> was a man who got involved early on with the Marines and then hit the streets, drug dealer, got charged with murder. We believe he was innocent, but he spent the last 30 years of his life, more than half his life in prison. I would visit him. He became Moorish Science Temple of America priest, um, a man convicted by his own revolutionary conscience about what it meant to be an African in America. Um, and so that was our unique experience. I was at the University of Pennsylvania teaching. He was at in the penitentiary, w one brother at Penn, another brother in the pen. And so we, we had that experience. And when Soledad O'Brien did her first Black in America, they featured our story, the contradictory past. But what we understood, and as you understand so well, to be a Black man in this country means we are confronting both prisons and institutions of higher education. And both of them contain both a rich resource and possibility, unfortunately, for black men in, who, who before they go to prison may not know, may not understand, may not have been treated to certain forms of rigorous knowledge and self-reflection that they ironically enough are encouraged to pursue in prison. And many of us who go to institutions of higher education are nonetheless discouraged from the pursuit of that education in predominantly white institutions because of the lethal persistence of racial inequity. So that's my story. Been on the streets of Detroit. I didn't start college until I was 21. I was a teen father, hustled on the streets of Detroit, <clears throat> lived on welfare, did odd jobs, worked in my father's alma mater, Kelsey Hayes Wheel Breaking Drum Company. But at 21, I knew I had to go back to school, went to college, uh, pastored three churches, uh, went to school, uh, graduated, then went on to Princeton University to get a PhD. And I've been writing and thinking and preaching and doing my thing since then. So why is it important for Black men to have uh, study life? Uh, what are the top two books that you would, uh, and just maybe add a third, that a Black man, if he's sitting there struggling, has not established his canon of literature to start right. his uh, destination and journey inside, Mm -hmm. What would be your first message to him on what he should start reading and why? Yeah, that's a great question. Number one, always for me, James Baldwin's, uh, you know, The Fire Next Time, an incredible book that conjures uh, the social energy that is necessary for Black people to create a better future, but also names the bald, naked, white supremacy against which we are uh, arrayed that we are opposed to and finding ways in religion, uh, both within the black church, but also within the nation of Islam, as he talked about it in that book, to grab spiritual resources, bring them to bear uh, in a society that continues to look down upon us or marginalize us. So that book, number one, I would also read uh, The Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. That novel uh, sets out for us you know, black men up against the uh, impulse to see us or not see us, to render us invisible, to render us persona non grata. And then thirdly, I would read Toni Morrison's um, Solomon, Song of Solomon. I remember I had that book in my hand when I was kicked out of my apartment with my then pregnant wife. Uh, I was 18, she was 26. That's, that's a story for another time. But here we were in Detroit kicked out on Christmas day, evicted from our apartment. And in my hand, I had that book, uh, Song of Solomon, Milkman Dead, other memorable characters where Toni Morrison uses magical realism to imagine black men doing magical and miraculous things. So if I were to choose three, those are the three books that would give me a sense as a black man of my rooting in America. And if I were to add a little bit more, I'd talk about you know, um, the book that talks about the miseducation of the Negro by Carter G. Woodson and Souls of Black Folk by W.E.B. Du Bois would round out my probably top five. So when you 
think of a brother and he's trying to join the brotherhood mm-hmm. and he's trying to um, respect himself. You, right. The thing that I've always admired uh, about Detroit is you had the shrine of the Mac Madonna at the same right. time. So it wasn't that everybody was thinking. You did have Riverside Press coming right. on. Why is it important for you, if you would expound, to document Black thought so that we have a lens? And why should our community spend time and share with their children and other brothers recreational reading? Yes, sir. Very, very important points. You know, it's necessary for us to extend a tradition and ancestry and a trajectory that is often obscured out of ignorance, out of a f- refusal to pay attention, and out of a dominant culture's disinterest in the intellectual traditions which have nurtured not only Black people in America, but have made America better for their presence. So the reason it's necessary to focus on them is because we have to recover them in some instances, strengthen them in other instances, and make sure we know. You mentioned Riverside Press. Think about Dudley Randall in uh, Detroit, Michigan. Uh, Think about that intellectual tradition so rich and resourceful, Black poetry, Black essays, uh, the League of Revolutionary Workers drum, right? Think about the Black workers that came together studying uh, critical self-reflection through the lens of a progressive political outlook. And then they went into unions. All the intellectuals weren't in school. All the intellectuals didn't have degrees, but what they had was a deep and profound curiosity curiosity about how the world works and about their role and responsibility as public intellectuals, as grassroots intellectuals tied to concrete actions and practices in institutions we could identify, whether it was the church, whether it was the union hall, whether it was the bowling alley, whatever black people were doing and however they were pursuing it, learning was central. Why? Because literacy has been a major quest for black people since our time on this uh, planet and certainly on this continent. And why is it important for me to document? Because I come from a great people uh, with an unquenchable desire to learn. With my mother, out of uh, you know Alabama, Hyssop, Alabama, a little small city, 15 miles outside of Alexander City where T.O., the great ball player, uh, came up. Well, she wasn't allowed as a young black woman, and in fact was actively discouraged from pursuing higher education, but highly intelligent, highly cerebral, and she passed along that love of learning and especially reading, reading to me. So at 11 years old, I wrote my first speech for the Detroit Optimist Club, delivered it at 12, this I believe. And at 12 years old, uh, I made the newspaper for the first time in the Detroit News, 12 year old boys plea against racism wins award. And I ended that speech at 12 years old. One day we will uh, be able to transform our oasis of belief into a quality of success. So I started early thinking, reflecting, engaging uh, the world around me. When I was nine years old, Martin Luther King Jr. was murdered. I had never heard his name. I was sitting there on the living room floor when the newsman broke faith with his regular program to announce the death of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. I was stunned, immediately converted beyond my will. His his words, ebony containers of the pathos of black existence. And so I sent off for a little 45 uh, RPM record recording of his excerpts from his greatest speeches. And I memorized them. If you want us to end our moves into communities, open these communities. I'm tired of marching for something that should have been mine at birth. But man, I was just lit up. So like young people were listening to music and I was Michael Jackson, my same age at 10, Prince born in the same year, 1958, listened to him later. Madonna born the same year, 1958, listened to her even later. But the point is that this black cauldron of genius uh, allowed me to dip into uh, their, their tremendously fertile ideas and pools of thought. And I wanted to communicate that Martin Luther King Jr.'s inspiration because he was highly intelligent and highly articulate, giving speeches that changed the world 
And I wanted to be part of that as an ordained minister later on, as a, as a spokesperson, as a speaker, and as, especially as a writer, thinking, putting words to paper as we did then, or pen to paper, or now keyboard and stylus uh, reflecting our ideas. And so that's been a magnificent obsession with me. And I wanted the ability, I sought the ability, I gained the discipline to sit my butt in a seat and write because writing is like rhythm. It's, you know, it's like uh, Kobe Bryant putting up jump shots, a thousand a day. You've got to pete and repeat. You've got to keep doing it uh, to get your rhythm going, to get that shot up, to get in the rhythm of excellent shooting. And I wanted to get in the rhythm of excellent writing. And the best writer is a rewriter. So all of that was necessary to carry forth the enormously fertile traditions of black intellectual reflection, of concrete action, and of black intellectuals in all spaces and places in the culture doing what they do in Detroit was such a magnificent role model for that kind of grassroots public intellectual work. Let's talk about black men and the idea of having a spiritual life. Why should one require of oneself a relationship with a higher power, a God, a Allah, a Jesus, a Buddha, um, but why is it key for most Black men, when you think of both a Malcolm or Martin, all have had some relationship with some spiritual entity? Dear Reverend, dear Doctor, why mm. as a Black man should I worship a God? Wow. Man, you, you, just, you just hit the unusual but necessary angles. Uh, that's so such a splendid question. And I think one of the reasons, one of the major reasons that black men in particular, because the way you ask that is so important because we usually associate black church, black women singing in a choir, you know, maybe the male preaching, but for the most part, the spiritual lives of black people uh, are evidenced and symbolized in the pursuit of black women in churches, in pews, or, or in pulpits singing songs uh, and the like. But the black male spirituality is especially critical uh, to us to keep us organized around a logic and an ethic of self-regard and regard for the other. Because the more we've worshiped God, as you said, reading, reading the Bhagavad Gita, the Ulic Aram, the Tao Te Ching, the Bible, the Old Testament, whatever your religion, Black Panther, the art of motorcycle maintenance, whatever your religious text was, uh, so Tupac Shakur's uh, lyrics or Biggie's or Jay-Z's or Nas's or Lauren Hill's, whatever floats your boat. What's important is to understand a connection to a moral center and an ethical source that will govern your behavior against the impulse towards self-destruction. Religion at its best, no, spirituality even more importantly than religion governs us and gives us a raison d'etre, a, a reason to exist, right? In fact, spirituality makes religion behave right. Religion from the word ligare, to bind together, the institutional matrix that holds in place our communion with the Almighty. But spirituality is a sense of connection to all human beings, regardless of our religious denominations, regardless of who we call God or how we see ourselves as worshipers. And so in that sense, it's more universal. And love is a universal language at that level. And so it's important for black men to have a connection to something bigger than themselves, a, a spirit, a, a driving force, an animating force that overrides the material interests that we have so that those don't exhaust who we are as human beings. And to have a spiritual connection gives us a better sense of our fellow human being. I remember the late great um, church historian, James Melvin Washington said, some of us go to church to love God instead of our neighbors, <laughs> right? So at our, at our best, religion propels us into social movement and mobility and intimate space where we encounter each other and learn to affirm each other. And the reason it's important to your incredibly uh, rich question for black men to do that, instead of competing with each other, instead of putting each other down, instead of seeing each other as the roadblock to our own particular destiny 
or the barrier to our prosperity, if we were to see each other as co-conspirators for a more prosperous, involved, uh, evolved existence, if we would see each other as helping us on the way towards something bigger and better, my God, that would change our particular practices and perspectives. We wouldn't feel that we'd have to murder the next guy, put the next guy down, feel that we got to uh, eradicate that person's presence or wipe out their entire existence, uh, either literally, metaphysically, or metaphorically. We wouldn't have to do all that stuff. We could embrace each other and love each other. A spiritual home and a spiritual ritual, a, a practice of prayer, of reflection, of meditation, uh, is extremely important in giving us that sense of connection to the other, the ultimate other God, if we see it that way, or even if you don't even believe in God, to see yourself connected to other human beings, uh, vertically, if you don't have that, and at least horizontally, an appreciation for the other, that is the human being that occupies space on this earth and breathes right beside you. You know, thank you for that. Um, you've got the agency that we have as black men mm -hmm. and we want to be accepted and there's a level of mental illness mm -hmm. and emotional lack of empathy that we have for each other. Right. The anger management issues that we right. have, the um, paralysis of what self-doubt and lack of appreciation for this society has left us mentally. Right. How have you, if you would share, because you're in academia, but clearly know that there should have been a bidding war for you to move around, given mm -hmm. all that you have, um, you have to not just accept where it is, but, it, but clearly whether you wanted to be at Harvard, it should be your choice. Whether you want to be at Howard, it's your choice. But mentally, how have you done battle and been able to continue, if you would, share some of your moves and why emotional, if you'll use an emotional language, why we should be able to cry together, why we should be able to show our vulnerability as men out loud? Yeah, no, that's another profoundly provocative and insightful question. You know... Black men's emotional lives, you know, have been hidden and masked from the broader world in terms of the intimate networks of association and affiliation that sustain us. You know, the ones that are externally seen to the world, a fraternity, a, you know, a gathering of black men in a civic group and the like, even those are distorted through the lens of a culture that doesn't understand how, how important those uh, forces and functions were in our lives. But for those men who don't even have that opportunity, that elite access generated around a fraternity or a civic organization, um, there is the sense of connectivity to each other and figuring out what we do uh, to forge those connections to maintain our mental and emotional health. Uh, Y'all gonna make me lose my mind up in here. Up in here, the late great DMX said, Brother Earl. And so uh, we know that there are spaces and places that are alien to us, that make us feel marginal, that make us feel as if we don't belong. And we have to negotiate those. We don't have the luxury of retreating uh, from those spaces of alienation because we live in a culture where we are compelled to work, to play, to live, and ultimately to die. And so we've got to find ways to forge connections of spiritual strength and of emotional and mental stability because the, the relentless assault upon the black psyche erodes self-comprehension, self-understanding, self-love and self-regard. This I believe is a tribute to younger people who have taught us the need for that and given us permission to say to each other, let's be vulnerable. You know, we can all be like the OJs. Last night, me and my woman, we cried. We cried together, right? Um, and so to talk about that, I mean, how, re how revealing was that of a song? Oh my God, you know, what's going on with Eddie and them and Walter? What are, what are, what are they doing? 
Yes, we cried together and then we made love, right? So that there was a connection between the cleansing of the emotional palate, clearing way for the intimacies of the sexual appetite. And so instead of Viagra, we had a good cry. Though some of us may need both. So the point is that it is extremely important uh, to understand the way in which the mentality of the black psyche, right, the, of the black mind, the mentality, the approach, the mindset is often contingent upon finding ways to remain stable in the midst of a destabilizing, punishing culture. How do you think well about yourself? How do you continue to get up every day and believe that you have a purpose? How do you understand that despite what the society says about you, you are not what they say? I remember when I was a young man uh, on vacation in um, North Carolina, and I saw another a younger man who was a preacher, uh, not yet famous internationally as he would grow to become, uh, still living in West Virginia, not before he moved to Dallas, uh, named T.D. Jakes, and he was on a television. He said, you might have done what they said you did, but you're not who they say you are. I said, wait, wait a minute. That ain't no regular preacher right there. Slow down. <laughs> that brother saying something that is psychologically powerful. And a guy like a T.D. Jakes, uh, like a Manuel Scott, like a Frederick Douglass Haynes, like a Frederick George Sampson, like Gina Stewart, uh, but we're talking about men, so I name mostly them, uh, or Emily Towns, those figures have helped us understand that our mental state is closely connected to our ability to have healthy self-regard. And that healthy self-regard is often nurtured in cocoons of intimacy in churches, uh, in temples and synagogues, in, in the homes of human beings who worship an almighty God, but also who understand the necessity for black self-love, black self-regard. It didn't start with Black Lives Matter, though that's important, right? No matter how hard you try, you can't stop me now. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. Angela Davis with hand raised to the air with George Jackson, big Afro, but she was more than an iconographic iconographic expression of black pride. She also dug deeply into the wells of black intellectual uh, reflection, but we also need that emotional cleansing, that emotional purification where we purge from our breasts and our bodies uh, the deadening impact, the stifling effect of beliefs and aspirations and emotions that are full of jealousy and envy and hatred for the other, that despise the success of the other, that doesn't see your success as my success and mine is yours. So that mental stability is extremely important and we've got to practice it. Prayer is important, self-reflection is important, talking to a therapist if you got enough money and resources is important, thinking you a man and you are gonna handle it by yourself and you don't need nobody else to help you, that's poisonous, that's unnecessary. We need to love each other, cry with each other, open our hearts to each other. Because if we cried more, we'd kill less. If we, if we expressed our vulnerability more, we wouldn't have to uh, target another brother and see him as the embodiment of everything that I despise. So the mental and emotional are crucial to the maintenance and preservation of a healthy sense of self and other as we continually strike out for new territories of progress in this country. Well, let's talk about studying you. Mm. Let's talk about studying you. Um, your first book, title, why you wrote it, and why Black men should read it. Wow. Well, my first book was Reflecting Black, uh, African American Cultural Criticism, 1993. And I wrote that book uh, before I had actually uh, sat down to uh, publish my dissertation. So I was like, well, daggum, if my book is coming out in June and it's now like March and April, I got to get the PhD. So, you know, I wrote a prospectus, handed in the prospectus. They, uh, you know, interrogated me for two, three hours at Princeton. And then they accepted my dissertation proposal, which meant now I could take two and three and four and five years to go off and write it. When I, I said, you accepted it? They said, yeah. So I reached under the table, 
pulled out my dissertation, threw it down and said, here it is. There was an audible gasp in the room like, oh my God. I can remember uh, Obrey Hendricks, who's now a well-known biblical scholar went, darn, let me just say that other word. And so he said, GD, oh my God. So I took a chance on myself. I risked the belief that what I wrote was worthy of being recognized by my mentors and by a, you know, a panel of scholars uh, to suggest that this work was worthy of receiving the ultimate uh, degree in my field, the terminal degree of the doctor of philosophy, the PhD. And so, you know, that put me on a road to study, uh, to think outside the box and to reflect on our culture. And so along the way, because my brother was in prison and I needed money to support him. So I write articles here and write essays there and the like. That's how my first book kind of came together out of necessity. People invited me, I wrote and responded. Had Rolling Out been available then, I would have been writing for Rolling Out. So the thing is, is that because of those available literary organs, I was able to practice my craft. So that first book was created as a result of many of the articles and essays I wrote for law reviews and for local free papers. I began to write for the Hartford Advocate uh, in around 88 because I had left uh, Princeton for three years uh, of graduate school and then went to teach at Hartford Seminary and run an anti-poverty program. And I said, there was this new invention called the CD, the compact disc. Now y'all young people now think is old and my God, what the heck is that? But trust me, when I was coming up, 1980s, mid eighties, this new thing called a CD, you mean it's not a record player. You don't get the pop, the hiss, the scratch of the stylus unraveling uh, the lines on a compressed wax album, Dad gum, you got the clean sound of a compact disc with a laser beam reading the encoded material. So that was new and I wanted some and I had to save some money to get it and I was a poor graduate student. So when I wrote for free for this newspaper, they would send me free copies, uh, review copies of the music to review. So I just, like I tell my son, you know, I tell all of my children, Find something you love to do that you would do if nobody paid you a dime and then find a way to get paid for it. And so that's what I tried to do. I love music. I love listening. I love going to see Luther Vandross and Anita Baker in concert, Karen White in concert, Freddie Jackson in concert. So I wrote reviews so I could go see the concerts and I re wrote reviews of the music so I could get free CDs. So necessity really is the mother of invention. Out of that, I created my first book and I ain't looked back ever since. I've been always trying to balance serious critical engagement with the larger world of a scholarship, plus the kind of public expression of ideas in ways people can understand and therefore engage them. Because I started school later, I was not bewitched by the belief that I had to write for other scholars, that, I, that the, my main audience was other thinkers who had a similarly narrow training for whom I spoke. No, from the get-go, I knew I was speaking for the broader audience, for the people in the galleys, for the folk who didn't get a chance to go to college, and how could I translate that learning into acceptable forms of expression that some of them might understand and that might be useful to them as they negotiated their lives in this culture. So that's why it's important uh, for me, my first book down to my 24th book to continually put stuff in there that will challenge people, that will cheer people, that will comfort people, that will make people uncomfortable and then force them to think about the issues about which I write. The last question, I was um, hanging out one day, clearly um, I put on a Detroit suit on a Saturday, mm -hmm. had no reason just, um, Spiritually, this um, ghost came in the room, right. said, put on a, a, a suit. And I mean, I, it's a straight suit in Detroit. It, it was uh, beautiful blue. It, it had green stripes. And I had a green and blue check suit on and had it custom made and um, couldn't get it off. I just couldn't. So I, I said, it's Saturday. I'll need to wear it. Somehow, I still took the suit and took it off and put it back on. And then my team calls and said, you got to interview somebody. You, you might know this person, but 
I, I said, well, darn, I got this suit on. I got to go interview him. Who is it? They said, you don't need to know who it is, but you're going to want to be in the room. So I still have no idea. I said, well, let somebody else do it. And I had no clue who it was. And finally, I get there and they say, you got 15 minutes. And I'm at the hotel in Chicago with a suit on on a Saturday. I'm the only person dressed up in a suit. And it's uh, Kama and, and Maya Angelou. Mm. And they, she was there for his foundation's fundraiser. And uh, they right. say, you get one question. And uh, I say, uh, well, you know, very nice to meet you. And then, you know, she's so regal. She starts mm -hmm. to flirt with me. You've got a wonderful suit on. You look so handsome, you know. Right, right, she, right. she just understands everything. She takes a little oxygen. And I say, well, I only get one question. And you're next to... Uh, a wonderful brother, and you've been hanging out with the, the president. And I said, um, if you could tell all black men one thing that they should know, what would it be? And so mm. I'll ask you that same question. Mm. If you could talk to all black men right now, what would you tell them? Wow. I'm just curious about what Maya Angelou said. <laughs> My Lord, you'll have to tell me that story one day. If I And I knew her. We, used, we would uh, sit at Susan Taylor's home in Sag Harbor and uh, trade country music lyrics uh, with each other. Been down so long, down, look up, and blues. Down, look, looks up to me. And then we would sing some of those country songs. Uh, a man complaining about his wife cheating. He said she had a ring on her finger, but time on her hands. <laughs> or he said, uh, one of them said, if I would have killed you when I met you, I would have been out of jail by now. So we, we had great fun in talking about those lyrics. But if I were to tell black men one thing, if I were to share with them one thing, I would say to them that the ultimate expression of the human being, the ultimate point of drawing breath and having blood flow through our veins is the ability to embrace each other and the God who made us in love. That is my word. Love is the ultimate manifestation of both the higher purpose of our existence and the ability to forge community here on earth. And if you can find that meaning, not the namby-pamby, not the saccharin, not the, you know, eros-driven conception of love, but love as the ultimate ability to embrace oneself and the other and see us both tied together as Dr. King quoting Howard Thurman said, in a single garment of destiny, if we can find that resonance of love, that is what I would tell them. And I would end by saying something that I came up with in 19, I think a, a phrase I first uttered in 1992, that justice is what love sounds like when it speaks in public. So the love I'm talking about is manifest in the world as justice. That's wonderful. Mm. Um, she said, forgive yourselves. I would tell all black men to forgive mm. yourselves. Mm. The women have been taken away from you and there were nothing you could do about it. Mm. They still take life away from you and there's nothing you can do about it. Mm. So forgive yourself. That's, that's a great word. Yeah. I want to thank you, Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, for the love that you've given us Black men today here at A Seat at the Table. Thank you so thank very you so much, much for those extraordinary questions. I can honestly say I ain't never been asked them kind of questions in an interview in my, in my 35 years of doing this. So God bless you, my brother. Thank you. Mm -hmm.